So nearly everybody would agree that we live in an age of consumerism. We live in a time in which everything revolves around consumers. During the crisis, we hear worries about consumer confidence. We hear that the world economy depends upon the spending mood of Americans. Yeah. Depending upon whether Americans are willing to go to the mall or not, whole economies can collapse or they can succeed. We hear that companies are constantly, and we see that, in, uh, creating new and innovative products, new versions of old products, constantly new markets, all to satisfy the needs of the consumers. That's what we hear. We also know that shopping is one of the major hobbies, maybe one of maybe the main hobby for most people nowadays. I was, just was told that there's now travel firm, firms that advertise trips to Dubai or other countries to do what? To go shopping. Yeah. To travel across the Atlantic, to go to New York, and to go shopping. And this is all generally taken as evidence that in this economy, it's all about consumers and their needs, consumers and their desires. If there is any disagreement about this issue, it doesn't deal with that point, but with whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. One group of people would say, well, the fact that everything revolves around consumers is proof that this is a very rational economy. It proves that people's needs, what they want, and what they desire are the purpose of everything. The other side, and perhaps that's the majority nowadays, would say that consumerism is a bad thing. It's not only dangerous, it's unethical. Uh, they would say that consumerism, that is, let's say, an obsession with consumption, an obsession with having more and more stuff, is the cause of many of the problems we see nowadays. Environmental destruction, poverty in the third world, even overwork and stress uh, in the rich countries, the so-called rich countries. Both sides agree it's all about consumerism. The disagreement is whether we should be happy about that or not. Tonight, I want to argue that both sides are wrong. I'll have a lot to say about that, but the main message I want to get across is relatively simple. Consumption is not the purpose of the modern market economy. Making money is. Second, that's why consumption is not the problem. Consumerism is not the problem. Many of the unpleasant things often attributed to what's called consumerism overconsumption in the first world is not due to people's materialism, people wanting to have stuff, but it's due to the irrational purpose of production, of production in this society, which is to make money. So that's the general proof I want to deliver tonight. Um, the talk is going to be divided into three parts. The first part, I want to talk about the objective role of consumption in capitalism. What role does consumption really play? The second part, I want to talk about the reality of consumerism. What does consumption look like in a market economy? And the third part, I want to spend some time talking about the notion of anti-consumerism, which is a more and more popular idea. OK, first part, the objective role of consumption in capitalism. Think back to what you've been hearing during the economic crisis over the last several years now. There's been widespread worries about consumer confidence. Yeah. What does that mean? These are concerns about the fact that if people don't consume, if they're worried about not having a job in the future, then they'll be less willing to go out and make larger purchases, less willing to buy cars, to buy a house, buy a Christmas tree, buy all kinds of stuff. Now, why is that a problem? It's not the fact that people don't have the things that they want or need. That's not the problem when there's worries about consumer confidence. That's not the problem at all. What is considered a problem is that if people don't consume, then that's a threat to the economy. That's a threat to the growth and the expansion of production. It might seem obvious, but it's actually a really strange thing. That might be something that everyone takes for granted. Yeah, if people don't consume, then the economy can't run. But in fact, that very fact characterizes the absurdity of the entire market economy. 
Think about it for a second. If the problem is that people don't consume, there can't be more production, then it turns out that production in this society is not a means for consumption. Yeah? Production is not the means where consumption is the aim. It's just the other way around. In this society, consumption is a means for production. Think of another illustration. What's the other reason why it's often said it's a problem if people don't consume? Well, if people don't consume, then companies can't make money, then companies can't create jobs. That's the big problem. Again, that might be something that most people take for granted, but that's, in fact, rather odd. In this society, why should people consume more? What's the purpose of having them consume more? Or let's say encouraging them to consume more. So more people can do more work. I always thought that work is toil, it's sacrifice, it's a negative thing, something you want to minimize. Maximize consumption, minimize production. Here's just the other way around. Consumption is needed so that more and more production can happen. Here, the more work, the better. Well, how can that be? Certainly the purpose is not just to work for the sake of working. Not everyone's crazy and thinks that just work is the whole purpose. What that does tell us is that the purpose of work is not consumption. Rather, the purpose of work is to make money. And because that's the purpose of production, there can never be enough work. Now, one could say, so what? What's the problem? So what? It's all about money making. Everybody knows that. But is it money making? maybe the best incentive to produce for needs. If companies know that by producing more, they can make more money, well, then doesn't everybody win? Doesn't this mean more money for the one side, more goods for the other side? If consumption is a means for production, that's great. That means they want to have people consume. Everybody's happy. Not quite true. It's crucial to recognize in what sense consumption is a means for production. In what sense is consumption a means for making money? Not the fact that actually people satisfy their needs. It's not the fact that people live in homes. It's not the fact that people um, wear pairs of shoes, like I said, drive cars, live in homes, go on vacation. Not their actual consumption. That's meaningless. Consumption is a means for production because consumption always means you have to pay money in order to get a hold of all these things. Consumption's not the point. The point is that you have to pay in order to consume. That's why consumption is a means for production. Again, might sound obvious, but what does that mean? What does that imply? The first thing that implies, and this is the most drastic consequence, if people don't have money, if people don't have the money to pay for all these things, their consumption is meaningless. It's economically insignificant. That's the first refutation of the idea of consumerism. If people don't have money, they don't get a hold of the things they need. Clearly, means and ends don't harmonize here. Consumption might be a means for production, but not in the sense that people actually get to eat stuff or wear stuff, mm -hmm. the fact that they have to pay money to do so. And if they can't pay money, their needs are worthless, so they don't get satisfied. And that, by the way, you could say as an aside, that's the entire explanation for modern poverty. It's that simple. Not a lack of goods. Rather, a lack of money in order to purchase those goods. So it's not a lack of production, a problem with production. It's the purpose of production that is the cause of poverty. Because it's about making money when it comes to production, people who don't have money don't get anything. Let me give you a better illustration of that. We're right in the middle of an economic crisis. Everybody knows that a crisis is a major problem. But what is actually an economic crisis? What is that consistent? Does that mean that there's not enough stuff? A lack of goods? Nonsense. Stores are overfilled. Companies complain about the fact that they have tons of goods that they can't get rid of. That's not the problem. That's not what an economic crisis means. Is it maybe a lack of the means to produce things that people need? Nonsense. Auto companies complain about excess capacity. We could produce tons of cars, but nobody wants to buy them. The problem is we have too much ability to produce things people need. Is it a lack of people in order to do the work? No, mass unemployment. In fact, an economic crisis, and this is an absurdity that only capitalism can manage. 
An economic crisis does not mean a lack of all the things that are needed. In fact, it means there's too much of all that. The question is, too much for what? Clearly, not too much for people's needs. There can never be enough of that. Too much for the purpose of making money. And because all these goods, because goods, means of production, and people are currently not useful for making money, they are too many. There's too, many stuff, too much stuff, too many means of production, and too many people. So, first refutation of consumerism. Second point. Like I said, consumption is important in the sense that it means people purchase stuff that they need. It's the fact that they pay money. That's why consumption is important. And one could still ask, if people's ability to pay for things is a means for the economy, why is there always a shortage of people's ability to pay? You know, why do companies always complain about not having enough customers? You know, how does that come about? Even though it's a means, there's always too little of it. Why is that? Well, think about the source of most people's income. It's clear. Most people earn income by earning wages. They go to work for a company, they, and they earn a wage or a salary. But when do wages get paid? Of course, wages only get paid if they pay off for an entrepreneur. If a company uh, reckons to make money by making use of your labor, then you get wages. If not, no income. Well, when does it pay off for companies to pay wages? Well, wages are useful for a company. They pay off for a company to the degree, to the degree that they're very low and to the degree that people do a lot of work for them. What does that mean? Wages pay off for companies if people get as low as wages as possible. What that means is that their livelihood, their ability to consume, it's a negative thing. It's a cost factor. It's a deduction from the wealth that's really important. Think about that. How do companies succeed in business? If anybody reads the newspaper, watches television, or talks to anybody else, they know. You pay as low as wages as possible. Minimizing people's ability to consume is the way to success. What that means, in short, is that people's livelihoods, if they earn it all, get an ability to consume it all, it's only if they're useful for profit. And their usefulness for profit consists in them earning very little and working very much. Now, this fact, which one could describe as a contradiction between people's needs and companies' needs, Contradiction between people's needs for a livelihood and the company's desire to make profit. That contradiction is a contradiction for companies as well. By minimizing wages in relation to the amount of work that uh, companies let people do, on the one hand, they can increase, increase their profit margins, yeah? reduce their costs, and sell their goods. On the other hand, what it means is that they minimize the purchasing power that they can earn on the market. And it's that fact that has given rise to a very popular argument, one that we've also heard in the crisis, and very common among mostly it's a unions and social democrats. And the idea is that, well, if companies would only pay higher wages, then people would have the means they need to consume. So if companies pay higher wages, then people can purchase more, and this is good for both sides. This is good for companies. Or if the government can intervene, let's say, create a minimum wage. So we'll also put more money in people's pockets, they can spend more, companies can make more, the economy is happy, everybody is happy. Three things I want to say about this idea, very widespread. The first point is that it's a false economic argument, but I'm just getting started. <laughs> The second point is that it's never really intended seriously. And third, it's a very, very submissive argument. Very, very subservient. First point, why is it a false economic argument? It's true. Companies want to make as much money as possible. That's why they always want other companies to pay more. Other companies should pay more wages. No company will pay wages himself. Other companies need to pay higher wages. Why is that? Well, it's because what I just said. For a company, Wages, long before there's something a company wants to get a hold of, they're first of all a cost factor, a deduction from the wealth. 
That's why the purpose is to pay as little as possible. Now, if the purpose for them to pay higher wages is so that they can make money later, the idea is pay more money now, I make more money later. There's a much more safe way of doing that. That's to not pay out any money at all. If that's the purpose, if companies are to pay higher wages in order to earn more later, then they don't even expose themselves to the risk that that money might flow elsewhere. They just keep it. That's why that argument is simply economically false. Both sides aren't happy. The contradiction remains between wages and profit interest. The second point is, I had said that this argument is never really intended seriously. Unions present this argument in order to demand 3 to 5 percent wage increases. Well, if the argument were true, if paying higher wages meant it was good for companies, why not ask for 100 percent, 200 percent, 300 percent? The more wages in the pockets of the workers, the better it is for companies. No, it's an argument used to pay, let's say, 3 to 5 percent. Apparently, the people who present this argument have a good deal of respect for the fact that people's wages, people's livelihoods, are first of all a cost factor for capital. That's something that they know, that's something that they recognize and say, yes, our usefulness for you is the fact that we earn a little and work a lot. And this would be the transition to my third point. The real basis of this argument is this subservience. To say, look, the workers are so useful for the companies. They're so useful for you because they work hard and don't ask for much. They could be also useful for you if they spent more money at your companies. That's my very quick run through the objective role of consumption and capitalism. The summary would be, it's not only the case that, as I started off, that consumption is a means for production. That would be absurd enough. What an upside down world. It's not only the case that consumption is subordinated to production. Yeah, that's the point. If people don't have enough money, then they can't consume at all. If people can't satisfy the producer's need for profit, they can't, can't buy anything, can't consume anything. So it's not only a means for production, for money making, not only subordinated to money making, it also stands in opposition to money making. The less workers earn, better for profits. That's the objective role of consumption and capitalism. The next point I want to talk about is, well, what does consumption look like if it is a means for profit making? What is the reality of consumerism? One point I'll be already mentioned is that if people don't have any money, they can't consume anything at all. They are economically meaningless. Well, how do capitalists make money? First of all, they offer products for various needs. Yeah? Produce all kinds of things, make all kinds of different offers yeah? for all kinds of different consumer needs. The purpose, of course, is not to serve these people's needs, but to make use of their needs. You could even say exploit their needs in order to make money. Again, that means that those who don't have any money don't fulfill their needs. And that's why certain things aren't on offer at all. There are certain things you just can't buy. Can't buy, buy plenty of free time with your family. Can't work out. There's no such thing as nice, clean apartments for everybody. Simply can't happen. Simply wouldn't be profitable. However, as we also know, anybody can walk through a supermarket or walk down uh, the main shopping street in any city in Europe and America and you find out that the market economy is characterized by an enormously broad spectrum of goods. An enormously broad spectrum of products, from high quality to low quality. Products at all different levels of prices and all different levels of quality. There's Mercedes and Dasha. There's low price and there's luxury. There's Prada bags and then there's 99 cent stores. There's brand name products and there's generic products. And usually that's considered a rather positive thing. Why? Because one says, there's something for everybody here. If you can't afford a Mercedes, well, you can get a smaller car. Not everybody can afford a Prada bag, so go and buy a generic bag. There's something for everybody here. All different kinds of needs, you can find the product that you want. Well, 
The problem with that idea, what makes it so wrong, is that these different levels of price and quality are not for different kinds of needs, but for their diff they're for different levels of poverty. Think about it this way. In what sense does a 99 cent store correspond to somebody's specific needs? In what sense could somebody say, a 99 cent store, that's just for me. That's what I need. I don't need brand name goods. I need a generic good. Yeah, the only reason that that corresponds to their needs is because they can't afford anything else. That means it doesn't correspond to their needs. It corresponds to the size of their wallet. That's why the purpose and the result, both the purpose of this spectrum of price and quality and the result, is that companies manage to mobilize even the smallest amount of money for their needs for their profit needs. That's why you can find the most luxurious oddities, the strangest things you can buy for the highest prices. On the other hand, stuff that you can buy, it doesn't function 30 seconds later. Yeah, maybe even the same version of the same product. Maybe it breaks right away. The purpose there is not to fulfill different kinds of needs. That's pretty clear. The purpose is to mobilize purchasing power at every level of the hierarchy, let's say the social hierarchy. The second point, something also everybody knows about, innovation. Companies are constantly bringing new and improved products onto the market, wholly new products that didn't exist before, new versions of, up, uh, of old products. Again, this is often uh, considered a reason to, um, let's say, to consider the market economy very rational. Look, they're always bringing out new and better products. What could be better? Satisfying more and more needs. Uh, well, not quite true. It's true that there is constant innovation, constantly new products. But because the purpose of that innovation is not to satisfy new needs, but rather to make money, this process of innovation goes along with a whole lot of irrationalities. The first thing is, in a lot of cases, it doesn't really matter whether the new products are any different or any better than last year. Really, the point is just newness itself. My favorite example of this, I'm not sure if any of you have ever been in an American supermarket. It doesn't matter whether you're in a big city or in a small town. Thousands of different kinds of laundry detergent. Everyone says new and improved. Nobody could name the difference. Clearly, the purpose is not to develop, let's say, a more quality product, but just to point out something is new, something is different from everything else. Or think about cell phones. Um, remember... When was that? A few weeks ago, I read a study that I think 99% of the population can use maybe 15% of the functions that their cell phones have. I know that's at least the highest for me. Sure, I don't want to criticize the fact that you can do lots of things with them. What I want to point out is that that's certainly not the purpose of the product. All kinds of innovation, not there to serve different needs, but to have some kind of a sales argument. But that's, let's say, the most harmless thing about uh, innovation when it's about making money. The second thing, innovation goes hand in hand with a remarkable waste of labor and resources. <sighs> Plenty of products that are perfectly good for use, but since they're no longer competitive, maybe there's another product that's slightly better or has managed to have some kind of a sales argument for itself. They're no longer good for competition on the market, therefore they don't get used, therefore they get thrown out. And this is true for even for food, all the way up to computers. Tons of perfectly functioning things, cars, they don't get sold, they get thrown away. Not because they're not useful, not because there's no need for them, but because they're not useful for the, means of make, uh, for the purpose of making money. They get thrown out. Third point, nowadays companies even plan for that fact. Has anybody ever heard of the term planned obsolescence? Obsolescence is the, the noun form of the adjective obsolete. And uh, what obsolete means is it's no longer state of the art. Yeah, it's no longer the newest thing. It's superfluous. Planned obsolescence is this um, thing that actually everybody knows about. Companies have purposely designed things that can only function for so long so that they can sell them again. New computers. You, could be that they just change one small microchip in the computer. Throw the whole thing out, buy a new one. Lots of tricks. Make repair costs inordinately high, so it's just as easy to buy a new computer. Change a little bit, make people buy a whole thing. Don't let people repair them, make it difficult to repair them, allow them to buy 
or cause them to buy new product. Maybe the most famous example of this are so-called terminator seeds from Monsanto. Has anybody ever heard of this? It's something where uh, Monsanto uh, Agricultural Chemical Company designing seeds that are sterile after one year. So the purpose is to buy them again. Now, I'm sure everybody knows about this example. Lots of people get horribly upset about it. This is really considered a general scandal. But what I want to point out is that the same principle is work everywhere. This innovation is not for the purpose of, let's say, satisfying needs. It's for the purpose of take, making use of those needs in order to sell new products. Here the example, or here the, the result, is an enormous waste of labor. Enormous waste of labor and resources. Yeah, that's part of modern innovation, if it's about making money. And the important point to recognize is this waste is not because of excessive materialism. Not because people simply want to have, let's say, stuff, or more and more stuff. The interest is to take advantage of that, even the most basic materialism, in order to make money. It's not because people want to have more stuff that that happens. It's because the interest is in taking advantage of those needs in order to make more money. That's why innovation doesn't go hand in hand with lots and lots of fulfilled needs. Lots of people get the newest stuff. Tons of people can't afford any of it. There you can see, it's not about people's materialism. That only counts if they have the money. This is important. Um, I think it's an important point to emphasize because often it's the case, if I make these points, a lot of people would agree, say, yeah, yeah, modern consumerism is horrible. All kinds of useless products. They produce things people don't even need. They even create artificial needs, needs that people don't really have. And the point I want to make is, in and of itself, the creation of new needs is not a bad thing. Why should that be a problem? That's, that's actually pretty normal. Any need that goes beyond, let's say, drinking and eating is an artificial need, something that comes from the society you live in. Part of the development of productive forces, the ability to produce more and more goods, is that new needs get developed. I don't see the problem. The problem is not the needs, but the purpose for which they're taken, adva taken advantage of. That's where their irrationalities come from. Again, that's why so many artificial needs don't get fulfilled at all. So many basic needs don't get fulfilled at all. And even the luxurious, strangest needs get fulfilled perfectly if there's plenty of money there. This is a point I want to come back to um, towards the end of the talk when I talk about the, um, uh, the notion of anti-consumerism. So these are yet two characteristic, two features of modern consumerism. The first one was this broad spectrum of price and quality. The second one is constant innovation. The third point is probably most familiar to everybody, advertisements and commercials as far as the eye can see. Yeah. A whole world full of advertisements. This is a point I want to spend a little time on. Um, Critics of consumerism, fans of consumerism, it all usually revolves around the advertising industry yeah, or modern life with ads everywhere. Well, first of all, simple question. What's actually the purpose of advertisement? It's not to inform people that there are new goods and where to pick them up. Yeah. Let's say that's the smallest part of advertising to say, hey, this thing you can now get a hold of, here's where you go and get a hold of it. That's obviously not advertising. And in fact... The whole industry, if this is my claim, would be a total waste of labor if consumption was the purpose of production. If the purpose was to organize production in such a way that as little work is done as possible in order to satisfy people's needs and desires. Think about that. What is the message of every advertisement? Again, not here's a product, here's where you get it, but buy our product, not theirs. Come and get our product, not theirs. Well, that teaches us, first of all, People's poverty doesn't come from the fact that there's not enough stuff. In fact, companies are competing to make the other guy's stuff superfluous. Come and buy our product, not theirs. We want to get them to throw away their goods. It's good if you don't make use of these goods. It might be perfectly good to use. Use ours. Again, advertisement, this whole message, buy our product, not theirs, really refutes the notion that consumption is the purpose. So the question is, how do they do that? How is that done? 
First rule is get your message out there. Billboards, advertisements, everywhere. Um, I, I live in Frankfurt at the moment, and I don't think there's a single toilet in the entire city where you're not staring at an advertisement while you're using the bathroom. And it's ironic because I grew up during, let's say, the 1980s at the high point of the Cold War, where we always heard about propaganda in the Eastern Bloc. Apparently, there's even places where there was a radio in the wall. You couldn't turn it off. Everywhere you looked, there was billboards saying, come to the next party Congress. You know, socialism is a worker's paradise, the dictatorship of the proletariat, etc. Propaganda everywhere. And yet, if you compare that with the reality of a modern market economy, people back then were really left in peace. <laughs> like I said, everywhere you go, there's propaganda for products. Everywhere you go, private propaganda. Well, let's take that. I want to take this comparison seriously for a moment. What is the common, let's say, commonality between advertisements, I'll call that propaganda for products, and uh, let's say political propaganda in the Eastern Bloc? The first commonality is a simple lie. And that lie consists in the fact of saying, we're here to serve your needs. It's all about you. Yeah? In both cases, not true don't even need to go into the Eastern Bloc. Here, the point of advertisements, they might say, it's all about you. We're here to serve your needs. Clearly, that's not the purpose. It's all about us. <laughs> it's all about taking advantage of what you have in your pocket. That's the basic lie. And you could say that's a commonality. But there is a crucial difference between, let's say, propaganda back then and propaganda in the modern market economy for products. And that difference consists in what all advertisements appeal to. And what they appeal to is the freedom of the consumer. Well, what is that? What is this thing? The freedom of the consumer. First of all, what it means is that people decide what they want. Nobody forces them to buy this or that product. They're free for themselves to choose what they buy. The second thing, let's say the second element of freedom of the consumer is a little more complicated. Or let's say it's a little more general. It's a basic message, which is what you own, let's say what you wear, what you drive, the products that you own, that's a sign of who you are. That's a sign of how successful you are. What you drive shows how successful you are. What you own shows how successful you are. The second point is your success, what you show, shows what a clever person you are. Shows how much you're in control of your own destiny. Yeah? Shows just how smart you are, how good you are at shopping, or maybe how successful you are at life. What cars you can manage to get a hold of, what clothes you can manage to get a hold of. Freedom of the consumer, therefore, means you choose. It's all about you. And what you buy and how you look and what you show about yourself is proof of what you really are. It's proof of what a great, successful person you are. That's the appeal to the freedom of the consumer. The first thing is, certainly, consumers have a choice. There's really nobody that forces them to buy anything. There's nobody who says, now you go and buy that. You choose how you budget your money. You choose what, stop, what shops you go into. You choose what you buy. Nobody forces you to do this. You're free to get a hold of anything. Nor does anybody forbid you from buying certain things. If you have the money, go ahead and get it. Yeah, that's freedom. Of course, what people are not free to do is to get a hold of the goods that they need, even if they're there, even if there's plenty of them, even if there's too much of them. You're not free to do that. Well, what is freedom, then, in this sense? What is the freedom of the consumer? The freedom of the consumer means make do with the means that you have. Freedom of the consumer means not at all you're able to consume well. You're able to satisfy your needs. Freedom of the consumer is not you can satisfy all your needs, but you have to make do on your own. If you don't have enough money to satisfy all your needs, that's nobody else's business. That's your own private affair. That's your freedom. Think about what an abstract, shabby thing freedom is. Nothing to do with how well you actually can consume, how much you have to consume. Rather, it's the point, I'm all on my own. 
If I don't have enough, well, bad luck. That's the freedom of the consumer. They can choose what they want, but what they actually get a hold of, well, that's a different question. That's why for most people, freedom of the consumer means being restricted to a very, very small portion of the products in the society, usually to the lower end. They can, in principle, get a hold of everything. In reality, because freedom means that they're on their own, they're restricted to the lower, let's say, the lower scale. Consumers themselves, of course, see the matter a little differently. Most consumers would say, well, I might not have a lot of money. And I might not be able to afford everything I need. But it's up to me to decide. They see the enormous amounts of goods on offer, the broad spectrum we just talked about. And they know that they can't afford all of that. But how do consumers praise their own freedom? By saying, it's up to me to decide. Really, they're taking the fact that they're excluded from all kinds of goods that they need and desire, even though they're there, and taking that as a challenge for their own skills and budgeting. I might not be able to afford everything I need, but I'm a good shopper. I know how to make my budget go far. I know how to make ends meet, is the, the phrase in, in American English, at least. I know how to get by. Really, they take their own restriction, their own poverty, the necessity of dividing up their money in between, let's say, various different goods as a challenge for their own freedom. I can go out and show what a clever shopper I am. Not only that, consumers see their consumption as an opportunity to show to others how successful they are. Yeah, I show if I buy the right shirt, I'm successful. If I buy the right car, I'm successful. Show to other people how much I'm the master of my own destiny. And advertisers know exactly how their consumers think. They know that's exactly how consumers think. Would say they know exactly what mistake consumers make. Abstracting from the reasons why they're so restricted from such a mass of goods. Abstracting from how poorly they might consume, how little they might have. Instead saying, yes, but it's up to me to decide. I'm free to decide, and I can decide skillfully. That's exactly the need that people, or the, um, let's say, the consciousness, the state of mind that advertisers take advantage of. And they do so in a way that's wholly appropriate to the market economy. They make it an offer and demand money in return. Now, this is a rather complicated point. That's, what I, that's why what I would like to do is to go through some of the most famous uh, marketing strategies and see how these points work. The points I want to show are, first of all, how do standard marketing strategies, marketing slogans, what do they tell us about the position of most people? What does that tell us about the reality of most consumers' situation? What I would say is, what does that tell us about their poverty? And the second point is, how do companies make use of that poverty, poverty for their own money-making interest? And third, how do consumers think about that? So, it's the three points I want to show. The first marketing strategy is obvious. It consists in advertising for a low price. Cheap. Here you can get goods that are cheap. Inexpensive. It's actually a strange advertisement. It might be the most common thing, and in fact, you'd be hard to find products, or let's say most products, that don't say how cheap it is and easy it is to get a hold of them. Now, it's strange. It's the most common advertisement, but it has nothing to do with the product. If something is cheap or not, it has nothing to do with the actual good for sale. Interesting. It's an interesting point. <laughs> Little musical accompaniment. I like that. <laughs> so the most, common or the most common sales argument has nothing to do with the product. It has to do with the ease in getting a hold of the product. How can that be? Well, that presupposes something. That implies that most people have difficulties getting hold of the things they need. It presupposes a lot of people don't quite have enough to make ends meet. Maybe they don't have nearly enough to make ends meet. And because of that general situation, that poverty, cheap is the best argument. So that reflects the poverty of most people. Second point is, companies take advantage of that poverty by saying, 
You know, you might not have a whole lot of money. You can hardly make ends meet, but here you can buy something cheap. Turn that into a, a, an opportunity for us. Third point is, how do most consumers think, I'm a clever shopper. I know where the cheapest prices are. I know where to get the lowest prices. I know when to buy the right plane tickets. I get there cheaper than anybody else. Especially nowadays, there's all these kind of advertisements for, um, for different flight company or plane company. What's the word? Uh, airlines. There's the word. Different websites you can go to to get there the cheapest. And they compare. They show a picture of people in a plane and compare how much people paid. Yeah? And always the clever guys are the ones who manage to pay the, uh, pay the least. Again, people are poor. They can't buy the things they need. But what do they do? They turn that into an opportunity to show what clever shoppers they are. Second point, very popular advertising, especially um, when it comes to selling food nowadays, quality. We have a quality product, not the cheap crap like the other guys have. Um, organic foods, think about that for a second. What does that presuppose? It presupposes that normally people can't get a hold of anything of quality. Look, we have a quality product. Uh, apparently that's not something that's self-evident. You would think that in a rational society, production for the purpose of, people's, of fulfilling people's needs, every good would be quality. Here, apparently quality is a special advertising argument that presupposes that normally what people get a hold of, what people can actually afford, is crap. Quality. Again, organic products is really the best example of that. Think about a whole, a whole segment of agricultural production Argues, with the, argues for the fact that, or let's say, advertises for themselves by pointing out that you don't get sick from their goods. <laughs> There's no chemicals in their goods. That tells us a lot about the purpose of production. It's obviously not for consumers. The fact that companies argue for their products by pointing out that they're high quality proves that most of the stuff is crap. Second, what do they do with that? Yeah, the other stuff might be crap. Normally, you can't afford anything of any quality. But with us, you can afford quality. Get quality from us. Don't be like the other saps that buy the crap. You know what's good for you. You know that you need to buy good food to be healthy. Buy our product. And that's pretty much exactly how consumers think about it. I don't fall for the cheap crap. I buy healthy. Yeah, everybody else buys an Aldi and somewhere else. And they might think that they're getting away cheap, but really, if you want to spend less money in the long run, you have to pay more money now. Again, they take the, let's say, ridiculous situation of the market economy revealed by this sales argument and turn it into a challenge for their own cleverness. I'm a clever shopper. I buy what I really need or what's good for me, what suits me. The next one there's a whole, let's say, a whole segment of products and a whole segment of advertising that explicitly refer to the crappy situation most people are in, to how poor people are, how stressed they are, how overworked they are, how little time they have, how sick they are all the time. Medication. This whole genre of advertising. Things like, you know you can't afford to be sick. You know that if you, don't, if you could lose your job, if you're sick, take our headache medication. You'll be fine. You know you don't have time to cook your kids a good meal. You don't have time to do all that crap. Buy stuff at McDonald's. Feed your family with a little bit of time. You don't have time to go exercise on the weekends. You don't have the money to go exercise on the weekends. Go out into the woods, take a vacation, buy our home exercise machine. Really, this just makes the same point explicit I've been talking about. All of these advertisements refer to how poor, overworked, stressed people are. Of course, not as a critique, but as an opportunity to do some business with that, to make an offer. You've got all these problems? Buy the product from us. But probably the most, let's say, widespread form of advertising has to do with brand names. Well, what's that all about? Well, what I pointed out with reference to these other points was really every advertisement, whether they sell cheap goods, quality goods, bargain goods, or goods for compensation, they all contain a basic message. 
And what that basic message is, is when you buy a certain product, you show something about yourself. You show that you're unique. You show that you're fashionable. You show that you're in control. You show that you know what you like and you're ready to show it. And the next genre of advertising takes this basic message that is really in every, every advertisement. Yeah, think of cheap. You know uh, where to find the cheapest products. You know you need quality. They take this message and make that into a part of the product itself. That's brand names. Not just shoes, Nikes. Not just computer, a Mac. <laughs> um, not just a bag, it's a Prada bag. Not just a car, a Mercedes, and so on and so forth. When you ha the idea is when you have or wear our product, then you don't just say something about yourself as a shopper, but about yourself as a person. And this image is really the point of this advertising. The product itself is not so important. The starting point might be a certain level of quality, but it goes far beyond that. The product is really the bearer of this certain image. The point is to show something about yourself just by wearing shoes. Something that has four wheels and you drive is all of a sudden supposed to say something about you as a person. Show that you're rich, show that you're smart, show that you're cool, show that you're independent or unique or rebellious. And usually that's exactly how consumers think about the issue. Buy a certain product, I show that I'm in. Yeah, I show that I'm in the in crowd. Or I show that I don't just follow the crowd. I show that I know what's cool nowadays and I know what's no longer cool. And the next, and this is the last genre of advertising I want to talk about. The step, step to the next genre of advertising is actually a really small one. And what it consists in is taking that message of every advertisement, show something about yourself, and making that into the entire product. This is the genre of so-called lifestyle advertising. These are the famous commercials where you have a hard time even finding the product in the, uh, in the advertisement. Yeah, so you're not just buying a Coca-Cola, you're buying that Coca-Cola feeling. Um, you're not just buying a Bex, you're buying the feeling of being out on a sailing boat with all of your friends. If you buy a certain kind of deodorant or a certain kind of aftershave, you're irresistible to women. Or if you buy a certain kind of perfume as a woman, you're totally mysterious and strange. And, or really, you buy into a way of life when you buy, some, when you buy this certain product. Now, everybody uh, likes to make fun of these kinds of advertisements. It's really easy to point out how ridiculous that is. Yeah. And nobody really thinks that when they buy a certain kind of aftershave that they'll really be irresistible to women. Nobody really thinks that by buying a Coca-Cola, uh, they'll have that, like, that Coca-Cola feeling and everything will be great and you know, loud music will play. But what is true is that when people go and shop, when people go and buy things, their interest is not just to get a hold of this or that good, but their interest is really to prove what fantastic, free, successful, in control individuals they are. That's something that really is true, and that is something that advertisers take advantage of. The other point I want to say is it's easy to make fun of all these goods, of, let's say lifestyle advertising. Everybody likes to make fun of them. I don't know anyone who would actually fall for these kind of things. But what I want to point out is that this principle, this principle, or the principle that's at work in lifestyle advertising, show something about yourself when you buy these products, is the exact same principle that's at work even in the most basic advertisement for cheap, inexpensive, or high-quality goods. It's the same thing. So, to summarize my second part, the question was, what is the reality of consumerism. What does consumption look like if it's a means for making money? To summarize, I could say, on the one hand, like I said, an immense variety of goods of all kinds and intense competition over consumers with all different kinds of needs. On the other hand, very different abilities to get hold of products. Lots of unfulfilled needs, Lots of needs that are fulfilled very poorly. 
along with the extensive satisfaction of very, very luxurious, strange needs. And in that sense, there's a nice correspondence between a hierarchy of goods of different quality and a class society, a hierarchy of different social statuses. In that sense, the world of consumerism is a reflection of a world of rich and poor, a class society. That's the reality of modern consumerism. Not excessive materialism. Not everybody wanting to have everything. If that was the point, there certainly wouldn't be any poverty. Now, consumerism is uh, not massive consumption or overconsumption. Consumerism is the world in which needs are mobilized and taken advantage of for making money. That's not the same thing as satisfying needs. But despite all their differences, so let's say besides beside the differences between rich consumers and poor consumers, they do have one thing in common. And that's this ideology I've been uh, emphasizing. Regardless of how well I can consume, or I can get a hold of the need, get a hold of the goods I need for my consumption, it's all about my freedom. It's all about finding what really suits me. Completely abstracted from whether they can actually get what they need, why they are poor, whether, why they can't get a hold of what they want. Everything is a challenge for their own skills and budgeting. That's the end of my second part. The, the next part I wanted to talk about the ideology of, or what I would call the ideology of anti-consumerism. Um, are there any questions before that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you making a causal claim about the status-oriented nature of society and capitalism? You said you're laying, are you tracing the causation back to the fact that people want status and that that's also true of capitalists, which is why they want to accumulate more than they can consume, and so that's where you get the accumulation problem as well. No. Um, no, would you claim that? <laughs> Not necessarily. I, just, okay. I thought that's what you were doing. What, what if I understood you quite properly, you wanted to ask me, do I think that, let's say, the cause of what I call class society mm. yeah, would be people's certain consciousness, the desire to show status? Yeah, that was the idea. Yeah. No. <laughs> that's not the point. Um, what I would say is that the notion that is becoming more and more popular nowadays, which is anti-consumerism, says exactly that. That's a mistake I would criticize. It's also something uh, I'll get to right away, but to emphasize my point again before I get to that, the cause of poverty has nothing to do with whether people want status or not. It has nothing to do with whether some people want to drive a Mercedes, other people don't get to. Poverty comes from something else. Poverty comes from the fact, not that there's a lack of goods, but because people can only get a hold of goods if they have money. What does that teach us? That teaches us that the satisfaction of needs is subordinated to the purpose of making money. If you don't have the money to satisfy even the most basic needs, even if you have no worries about status in your head, you can't buy products. And you don't even get an income. You don't even earn money. Regardless of what you think about status, you can't even get a hold of money to buy anything unless you're useful for profit as a worker. And how are you useful for profit? How can I go out and be useful for profit? It's first of all, not my decision. A company has to be able to say, I can use your labor. Now let's say the company chooses to use my labor. What does my income depend upon? Well, my wages are a cost factor. This was the first point I dealt with. I'm useful for, the profit, for profit to the degree that I earn very little and work very much. What a shabby source of income. I can't get it unless I'm useful for profit. And I'm useful for profit to the degree that I can hardly use this money because I get so little of it and I work a whole lot. That's the cause of poverty. Nothing to do with what people have in their heads. The emphasis that I put on people's desire to have status, I didn't want to say that that's the cause of it. Rather, I would say that's a false way or that's a false attitude about this reality. Lots of people are poor and they know it. Lots of people know that they can't afford all the different goods that exist. They know that they're restricted to, let's say, the lower level of the hierarchy of goods. But my experience, and this is frustrating, 
is the way people think about that. They don't say, well, why am I so poor? What is production about in this society? Obviously, it's not about satisfying my needs. What is the purpose of production? What is my role in that? These would be objective questions I would uh, encourage people to ask because I think the answer would be, well, I'm a dependent variable on the calculations of others. Most people don't think that way. Most people say, I know I can't afford much, but I have the freedom to decide. I might not be able to afford lots of things, but the important thing is to prove that I'm a clever shopper. The important thing is to look for those bargains, look for quality, show how successful I am in managing my time. Or maybe there's a different conclusion most people would draw. They would say, I might not have a lot of money, but it's important to show that I have a lot of money, or uh, not a lot of money, but to show that I'm successful. Go out and buy something that shows I'm successful. Clearly, that's not the cause of their poverty. That's an attempt to, let's say, cover up their poverty. To say, I might not have a lot of money. The important thing is to show that I'm not poor, that I'm not a sucker. Why couldn't it be the cause of their poverty? Couldn't you argue that the cause of poverty is also seeking differential wages? Um, say something more about that? Well, I mean, if you don't think that wages, and I'm assuming you don't, if you don't think that wages are somehow proportional to the contribution that we each make to production, mm -hmm. but we do observe wages at different levels and they're not rounded, so what generates them is the ability of certain uh, groups in society to organise themselves in such a way as to make their labour um, priced more highly. 